Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you to Richard for that introduction. Um, it's, uh, it's quite a, a packed webinar today. There's a lot of people joining, which I think makes the uh, gives me a lot of interest. Topics in and it's obviously something that um, be um, a very daunting area of people management, and I still have managers at the moment that will tell me they've had sleepless nights and lead up to disciplinaries. But they're actually also an essential part of people management. Um, and today I'm going to very much talk to you, uh, it's entitled The Practical Disciplinary. I'm not going to go through legislation with regards to the disciplinary process. Obviously, there'll be slight references to statute procedures in there as well. But today I wanted to talk to you more about how to actually do one and look at the practical tips and the considerations you should be making. Lots of these will be in line with the law. Um, and Well, actually, I hope everything I tell you will be in line with the law. Um, but what, I, what I'm trying to get across to you, I'm not going to just talk, talk legal jargon to you. It's going to be about the practical side of running disciplinary process. So there's a lot of familiar... Um, people on the webinar, but some new people too. So for those of you who don't know me, I am an HR professional, um, uh, qualified um, um, to, to, uh, within Human Resource Management and the CIPD. I have a consultancy, Red Elfin HR, um, and I am also part of the Business Springboard where we deliver management and leadership training. A difference with us is that we are all actually practitioners who train. So all our training is very current and practical and actually real life, which we receive a lot of positive uh, feedback for. Um, obviously, these... Uh, that any information I give you isn't designed to be specific in relation to um, a particular problem, um, and the copyright slides are the business springboard. Okay, so that's a formality's over with. So what we're going to talk about today, well, <clears throat> I want to first run through about the point of disciplinaries and what we're hoping to achieve in them. might sound quite simple, but I think that's got to be the main starting point in anything that we do. Obviously, the process has to be... Um, there's a reason for the process that we haven't made conclusions before we start it, and that's obviously it falls into the legal requirements, but we've got to have an objective when we start out, and I want to touch on that first. I'm then going to go into preparation, investigations, and the evidence that we um, gather for a disciplinary, talk about the actual hearing itself and some key steps um, that I find very um, efficient when I'm delivering disciplinary meetings, and then finally come and touch on making a fair decision at the end. Um, so as I said, disciplinaries can be daunting, um, can be um, challenging, but I always see them as a very positive thing. Now, that's probably because I'm always sat on this side of the desk and not the other side. Um, but I think I always try to project this image both to management and people in the disciplinary. Um, so that's an absolute key part for me. And I've had um, managers say to me that, you know, you know but that, that wasn't what I was expected in a disciplinary. That's, um, I, you know, that style of it to, to look at in that positive nature. But at the end of the day, we've got to look at what we actually want to achieve. So the first thing I wanted to, to ask is, what is the point of the disciplinary action? And if at this point anybody wants to use the chat box and tell me their own thoughts and feelings on this, that would be really welcome. Um, so I'd appreciate any, any feedback that anybody wants to put in there. Um, this Obviously, we, we're going to have variance depends on what we're looking at in the disciplinary. Um, and disciplinary action can be used for a range of things. We have one statutory procedure, but we'd obviously be looking at capability and conduct. So capability would be approved performance, things that have gone on along those lines that mean people aren't actually doing the job the way they should be doing it. The conduct may be issues that have happened at work, <clears throat> um, any violence, et cetera, a fight, um, drunken behavior, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole range of things that we would use a disciplinary procedure to cover. And there may be some people that term um, uh, a performance management procedure when it's looking at capability, et cetera. But fundamentally, it's the same action that we're looking at, the same um, steps that we should be following. So my main thing, and something I'd really like you to take away from this webinar, is that the main point of a disciplinary action is to restore behavior to acceptable levels. And that's what we should always be looking at. And that's why I say about the positive element of it. 
Um, yeah, and I'm liking some of the things that are coming through, so to improve behaviours, to improve performance, um, address. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what we're doing is addressing these issues, but our key thing should be to restore to an acceptable level. It's when something has fallen short of our expectations or needs or desires or um, acceptable standards, and we want to get that back to where it needs to be. If any of you have been on my performance management um, webinar, if you can remember I talk about types of performance and there's the acceptable type of performance and there's that that just sits underneath acceptable performance and then really bad performance um, and it's to address anything under those lines and what we should always be doing is getting that behavior up to that line because that's what we want to see and remember that the thing that costs us in business the most in terms of money and time is performance that just sits below that line so it's a problem but it's not a massive problem we can still use procedures like that to address it now they can be perceived as really negative particularly by the people that are doing it and i think that's where it comes down to us as people leading the action to put it across in the right way now i don't personally feel this is big stick stuff this isn't the opportunity for us to beat people up and tell them how bad they are it's an opportunity for us to sit down and say look we've got a problem this is the problem this is what we found out here's the evidence what have you got to say? How can we put it right? And my disciplinary action should always end on that about getting it right. Now, there may be some times when you are looking at gross misconduct where um, even, um, you know, right might look like a wrong because you, you might end up removing people for the business. But ultimately, that will be the best business decision. And that's what we're looking for um, to be in there. So I'd, I'd please always bear that in mind of why we're looking to do it and the point of the disciplinary action. Um, <clears throat> So the starting point um, when you have any disciplinary actions, disciplinary um, action would be your preparation. Now, part of that would be a full investigation. I'm going to talk about that in itself. Um, but we have to think of the full preparation of what we want to gain out of um, this and the evidence that we have. A lot of the legislation that goes around this is case law, and it comes up, that word fairness comes into it as well. Um, and that's hard because fairness is very um, subjective and it will mean different things to different people. But we've got to bear in mind past case law, what would be acceptable, what wouldn't be. So in your preparation, you're looking at doing a full investigation about gathering evidence and sharing that evidence as well ahead of the meeting. Um, very importantly, understanding your policy. Now, in the uh, if you didn't have a policy in place, um, you would always revert back to the statutory procedures, and any policy should look at um, the statutory procedures as a minimum. So you've got things like um, adequate notice, which is kind of viewed as um, two days. I always work on the two-day rule because um, that's been set up in case law. But adequate notice, it depends what people have got to look at and how much time you need as well. Um, you want to think about things um, like the representation and giving people a right to be represented. Are you unionized? Are you not? Even if you don't have a union recognized in your organization, the employee still has the right to be um, accompanied by a trade union official. Now, that's an interesting one because um, I, I think some organizations have found a bit surprised by that if they don't recognize a union and it's amazing in these situations how somebody's best friends uncles dad's son um actually are a trade union representative and they're willing to come along and that's absolutely fine don't get you know worried about that or anything their role is still exactly the same um and they're there to support the process what i would look at is if you have step outside of the the representation in your policy at all and again what's fair so the legal requirement is a trade union official or colleague now i have had somebody who turned up disciplinary room with a solicitor and i actually um, didn't allow them to attend the hearing and asked them to sit outside and wait um, and i have had people bring family members as well which on some occasions it wouldn't be appropriate and i haven't let them attend very occasionally, I've actually relaxed that rule and let them be attend uh, in advance, have this arranged, uh, by the way, 
to um, if it's a particular sensitive issue and you might be a, a small department or a small branch or a small organisation who don't have a, an abundance of colleagues in there to, to support them. But you've got to look at each one separately. I was always revert back to what that legal requirement is and anything you choose to do more, but check your policy in case you have something different in there. Um, also, think about who's going to conduct the hearing. So you have to think about this whole process. You need somebody to investigate, somebody to co conduct the hearing, and then you also need an impartial person for the appeal route, which you must have. And you need to plan that out right at the beginning. Um, so work to say, right, if this person's going to do the hearing, who's actually going to be my appeal route? So think about seniority. The other thing you need to do there is check your policy, because I have seen some policies that will say things that that um, you know, it has to be a manager of a certain level doing disciplinary um, procedures, so double-check that. Again, policies are a whole dif different webinar, but I would look to make sure that gives you flexibility. Um, there was some recent case law to say whether an HR consultant had the authority to dismiss and conduct a dis disciplinary procedure. Um, the, the tribunal actually ruled that they did, but the, the um, employer brought a claim to say that they didn't because they weren't actually employed by the company. So just ensure that your policy gives you that flexibility. The other things in your policy, I'd say that the, the, um, the notice that you need to give, don't always assume it's a statute minimum. Look at your policy to make sure that is because you may have five days notice in there. There will be the opportunity to extend that notice and um, reschedule the hearing if, for example, the employee um, can't obtain re adequate representation in that time frame. So all these things we've got to put into place and something else to add on there is housekeeping. Um, and it's kind of like my um, my little um, cartoon at the side there about bringing, be well prepared and bringing your sleeping bag because you don't know how long it's going to go on. Make sure where you conduct it. This is a very personal journey for somebody to go through this process. And it's a very private and confidential journey as well. So think about where you're going to conduct the hearing. Is it private? Are you going to make sure you're not interrupted? Even look at things like seating arrangements. As I say, with the view in mind that you're trying to restore behaviour back to acceptable levels, you don't want to put big barriers in there and make it you know, a, a really daunting prospect. You need to get all the issues on the table, discuss them and move forward. So think about your seating, think about time that you're not going to be interrupted and that you've got adequate time to do this. Um, think about who's going to do it. So we've got quite a bit to think of beforehand. Um, then moving on to the investigation. Now, a key thing here is what are you investigating? So what has happened and what does that require? Now, there's such a range of things we may be disciplining over. You know, it's it's hard to cover all of them being very generic, but let me give you a couple of investive um, examples. So if it was a conduct issue and the, the good old Christmas party and there's been a, a bit of an altercation between two staff two staff members and they've they've gone to fisticuffs over it. So what are you actually investigating in there? Now, that should be about that evening, and you need to look at um, who was there, what happened, taking witness statements from the people involved in it, and the people involved, uh, who witnessed it, look at what was arranged, who put what in place to safeguard the employees and to safeguard the company, was alcohol involved, you need to look at these things. What you wouldn't look at in those cases are, well, actually, he was a salesperson, his sales figures are rubbish. Why haven't you been addressing that anyway? You've got to think about what you actually want to investigate and make sure you're not sidetracked with other things. Not to say that you can't gather a few small issues together for disciplinary action, but you'd have to investigate each one separately and just make sure that you're doing the right thing on each one. Um, if it was a, a capability issue, so if it was, uh, you know, and use an easy one, um, a salesperson who wasn't performing and you need to follow a procedure to that, Get the um, evidence of the sales together, um, use comparators, look at benchmarks, think of what's fair, of what you're asking them to achieve, and make sure there's adequate time in there and the training, etc., that goes along with it. So we're looking to bring together facts and figures where possible and that quantitative um, uh, evidence. That isn't always possible, <clears throat> so there will be some um, other um, things like um, you know, customer complaints, 
other people's input into their witness statements and we need to bring all this together so this is why you've got to think very carefully about the time and how much time you've got to prepare this and what you do um, you should be letting the individual know that they're under investigation because you need to take a witness statement from them um, and then that will look into there is there an issue of suspension <clears throat> Now, you should only really suspend somebody, which would be on full pay and benefits and pending disciplinary action, if there is a sound reason to suspend them. And I always say that the re your, your um, marker there needs to be, would they then being in the business um, uh, uh, not allow you to do a fair investigation and put themselves or others at risk during that time? So if it was a violent conduct, then I would probably say that's quite wise to suspend. If it's a salesman just not achieving the figures, there's no real reason why they shouldn't be um, uh, why they should be suspended during that time. So you've got to think quite carefully about suspension. Bear in mind there's also a cost to the business because you're going to not have that person in there and be paying them during that time. So you've got to look at time scales. And case law would talk about fair um, suspensions for reasons, but also for pe fair um, time scales. Now, I always try to keep it to a minimum because I just don't think it's fair on the person to be sitting stewing and it needs to have a reason to do it so we can get the investigation together. Um, I recently had one organisation that suspended somebody. He was actually um, a CEO in an organisation, a small company, um, and they, they were investigating his conduct, but nothing was illegal, nothing was financial. Um, it was investigation his, his conduct in running the business. And they suspended him for three months while they, they did the investigation. Which one, massive cost. Two, is that fair to him? And he actually is um, currently bringing a claim against that organisation that it wasn't fair to suspend for too long. And I, I tend to, on the face of it, quite agree with that. So we've got to think of this fairness all the way through and think about timing of what you need to do. Um, to get everything together. Um, the other thing also in the investigation, think about confidentiality. Now, the, the kind of old saying of innocent until proven guilty still stands in here. And we need to be very respectful to the employees in that and respectful to other people involved in the investigation. Now, there's a couple of things to point out. Now, you see, you want to restore performance. So you've got to be very careful about the, the employee that you're investigating. But sometimes, and I, I've never heard of an organisation yet that can keep things completely confidential like this. It's amazing what gossip gets around and little bits, that, that tip bits that get out there. Sometimes I even would say in some disciplinary action that isn't a bad thing. Um, and it's kind of, if I, if I can use the term of slaughtering a lamb, and I don't mean this in a, in a really, you know, disrespectful way at all but if there's an issue within the organization let me give you an example of that i worked with an organization that had very poor attendance and we put in a um, sickness absence management procedure which mirrored disciplinary action it was just i said we can call them different things for different areas we um, had um, attendance meetings which were very similar to a disciplinary hearing with a couple of people at the start of the new procedure and it was it made a massive difference to the rest of the organization and the attendance dramatically improved and it's kind of there's no harm in people knowing that you will manage things if they know that you manage them fairly and in the right way and following the correct procedure if you weren't doing that then that obviously would be an issue in there so there's quite a lot to think about during the investigation and getting that right Moving on to the evidence that you want that you've gathered in your um, in your investigation, and there'll be a number of different areas of that. So, as I mentioned, there'll be the qualitative stuff like your sales figures, etc. Um, perhaps a you know a letter of complaint, something that's come in there. Um, we also need to look at if there's any reason for witness statements, and that's a really key bit I wanted to touch on because I had um, experience of this myself in a tribunal setting. Um, about the anonymity of witness statements and what's fair. Now, where possible, we would want witness statements to be from named witnesses. After all, it's only fair to the person who has the allegations against them to understand what it is so they can put their case forward. But you will find that there are times when people don't want to put the name on things like that. Now, there's some case law um, for from um, about... It was actually... Um, a, a family who, of people who worked in um, a factory, a number of different family members who worked in a factory, and there were, it was a theft 
dismissal. And as part of the investigation, many people within that investigation wanted to be anonymous and wouldn't put their names to it. So um, this disciplinary process went ahead with these anonymous witness statements and the, um, each employee, so they were all related in there, were dismissed on theft. They actually appealed to a tribunal to say it was unfair and that they should have had um, the names of the people in the witness statements. And in that case, the tribunal judge actually um, felt that this was a fair thing to do because the family involved were quite notorious in that area. It was a small village um, and this was a very strong presence. The family gave a very strong presence and in quite a negative way, an intimidating way. And the judge ruled, yes, that's fair to let these people be anonymous because they had a real reason to be fearful of having the names on that. We've got to think very carefully of it and wherever possible, I would you know, look for people to put the names of it um, if they're willing to come forward. And that's where you've got to manage that with our own personal skills and our soft skills to make sure that happen. Um, the tribunal case I referred to myself, which I had experience of, it was a case, a bullying case where we dismissed and a couple of people were anonymous and it was because they were fearful of retribution from doing it. And again, that was a link, a personal link within the small village that, that these people lived in. So we've got to be very careful because I got challenged an awful lot by that, by the tribunal chair. Um, however, he agreed that that was the right thing to do in the end. Okay, but a key thing, um, whose choice is it to be anonymous? It's actually the um, the witness, whoever you're getting it from. Um, if they say that I'm going to be anonymous, then I would put everything to them to explain the reasons why that you need that not to be anonymous. If you feel that the situation, like the example I've just given you about that family, or that when I went to tribunal, if you take that judgment, you think that's fair, and again, this is this fair who, who sees what, um, then that's fine. But if it was something where you didn't think, no, you don't, you know, you don't need to be honest, or it's going to come out, then you then have to make the decision if still, they still maintain, if they want to be anonymous, whether you do use that witness statement. And but ultimately, it's going to be the employee's choice um, to do that. Um, when you're taking a witness statement, be very careful in there. Um, is how you actually take it. Now, where possible. Um, you know, if you get the person who's making the statement to write that statement, so it's in their language, their vocabulary, you're not, you can't get accused of putting words in people's mouths, etc. Um, be very careful how that's taken. There are times when they don't have to write themselves, but I would always read it back to them, get them to agree and sign it off as well. And use the terms that they use. It's very easy for us to fall in that habit of, you know, paraphrasing and how we, what we think. We need to use the exact terms of what they say. So if they say, I was really scared, you need to write, I was really scared, not this person was um, horrendously frightened. You know, you need to use their terms and write down what they're saying in there. Um, and then have them signed if they can do. If they're not, if they want to be anonymous, they don't have to be signed. Um, you still can use them. Make sure you have the date and the time on them. Remember in all of this, we have to disclose evidence. And we do that ahead of the disciplinary hearing so that the employee has the time to review that evidence and put forward their case. So anything that we gather, we need to disclose at that point. So um, how I do it, um, you know, if you... When you give a notice of the disciplinary hearing, I would attach the evidence to that. And again, if that is electronic evidence like CCTV, it might be stills from that. You might ask them to come in and look at the video um, ahead of the meeting and then discuss it again at the meeting. If it's facts and figures, etc., you can get all that together and get it to the person. Um, as I'm, I'm covering all events here, don't think you have to get all of these bits of evidence for every disciplinary. Um, I've actually this morning conducted two disciplinary hearings. Um, I tend to find they come in a bit of a wave, so usually I have disciplinary fortnight, and I think I'm bang in the middle of one now. Um, and the two disciplinaries I've done today were about um, a performance, that some tasks uh, in two people's jobs weren't completed, and they'd actually signed a task book to say that they had. So the evidence that I submitted in that um, was um, a a copy of the task book where it had been signed and left blank and some of them signed um, when something hadn't been done. So when they'd signed to say they did something, I then um, had 
an, another chart which showed it hadn't been done. Sorry, it's a bit hard to, to tell you exactly what it is. Um, it, was, it was about some temperature checks. So um, I had the temperature book, so I took a, a copy of that. And then I took pictures of the various other bits and pieces that hadn't been completed and these, these people shift and supplied them to it. Again, I'll revert back to another webinar that I do deliver on given feedback. We need to be information specific and stick to those facts. And it's a lot easier rather than to say to somebody, you're not doing your job properly. I don't think you're very good. And I've just on that basis to say, last Tuesday at, on this shift, these are things you should have done. There's the evidence that you didn't do. Let's talk about it. So that's what we've got to look at. And remember, you've got to disclose um, that um, evidence. Um, the recordings of meetings, can they be submitted in evidence? I would firstly check about the recording and was that done lawfully? Because um, obviously we should let people know if things are being um, recorded. So if that was a meeting where you agreed for it to be recorded, that might be in writing. So the minutes of it, that of course, that can be disclosed. If it's an audio recording... Again, I would, in, in if we can give a copy, nowadays it's quite easy to do that electronically and email across if that's possible, um, or if somebody has the opportunity to come in and listen to it and take notes before the hearing. Um, if there's some specific areas of that, you can always document bits of the meeting in there that you want to talk about um, specifically. Okay, so the evidence is a key thing. Uh, the key thing for two reasons, for fairness and what you want to discuss. But the other thing, to give the other person an opportunity to prepare themselves. We don't want any surprises in that disciplinary hearing. They have a fair right not to have that surprise. And the third thing comes back to that managing performance. It's far easier if you have information specific and some evidence in there. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, waves of meetings. Yeah, um, Carol, I definitely have disciplinary fortnights that come around very often these <laughs> these days. I think it's just every, it must be something in the air or perhaps to do with the moon. You never know. Okay, so now you've done your investigation. You've got your evidence to the person. You've followed your statutory procedures and your, um, your, your company policy. And you actually sat there in the disciplinary hearing. You know who's doing the hearing. Always a good thing to have somebody there to take notes because I always find it's harder to take notes while you're talking as well. Now, notes in the disciplinary, that's interesting. And people have different standards as well. I never take a verbatim note of word for word. If you have a brilliant minute take available, then of course you can do that. What I record is the themes of the meeting and key parts of it. And that, I've built that up over years of experience. Um, you've, they've got to be adequate and they've got to be a reflection of what happened. But I don't record every mm and ah and 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 the. Um, but I'm very careful that that definitely re reflects the meeting that we had. So... Um, decide who's, when you're in there, um, who's going to be in there. And I say, what I like to have is um, the, the manager who's involved and either, uh, and if possible, somebody else take notes. If not, one of us will decide who is taking notes as we go along. Um, in that, if you haven't got other people involved, don't be worried to just say, right, um, let me just make a note of that and, um, and take some time out to, to sit back and do it. Um, Yeah, yeah, that's a really good um, good point there, Carol, to record meetings and take notes for that um, and not verbatim. As I said, there's no point in having all of that in there. Nowadays, we have so much electronic support in there to do different things, so you might choose to record the meeting. It always does help. So one thing on perceptions, we all have our own personal filters, so we'll walk away from things having a different perception of what happened in a meeting. So it's very good to have something to back that up on um, and to make sure that that is there um, as, a, as a backup of what happened. So these are the key points that I run through um, when we, uh, yep, yep, take notes themselves, absolutely encouraged, especially if they've got somebody accompanying them. Um, you can say that. Incidentally, just going back to that, I'm coming to the role of the company person, I'll call that. Um, the, what I do, firstly, is set the scene. So I tell people when they come in, this is a disciplinary hearing. You're not under disciplinary action at the moment. It's here as a formal way for us to sit down and discuss the issues that we have. Okay. So I'm setting the scene at the beginning. I'll say who's going to take notes. Um, I'll say we'll run through everything. Um, we're going to run through our list of issues. You're going to have full response full opportunity to respond when everybody said everything that they want to we'll adjourn and we'll see where we go next so from the start we're looking um, to have that in place um, now 
I think that's only fair to do. And remember, we want to restore to an acceptable level. And I'm a very big believer in putting people in a more natural state to get um, a, a more true reflection of that person, their thoughts and feelings. If we make it really, really false and we sat there with them at one end of the room in a panel of people and it's all very formally and our big sticks propped up in the corner, people are going to be nervous and we won't get them to cooperate fully, I, I don't believe. So that's my, my view on things. I would then re run through the issues. That's a very good point if in your disciplinary letter you've numbered them or broke things down into points and it can run through each one. It does help with note-taking as well and to, um, to keep the responses for that. But what you want to do is look at each issue, run through the problem, give them the opportunity to respond. So, for example, today I had, right, okay, on this date at this time, um, we, it's alleged that you didn't complete these tasks. Let's look at this task. What happened? That task. What happened? The other task. What happened? Um, at the end of each one, I always ask everybody in the room if they've got anything else to want to add. So that would be the employee, the company person if they have one, um, the other manager that's usually with me, um, and I make sure I say what I want to say in there as well. What you're looking to do is review the evidence of the investigation. So that's where your good investigation really comes into play and the evidence that you've put. So if you sat there with sales figures, you could say, right, can we just run through these figures? So last month you achieved X and your target was Y. The month before, et cetera, et cetera. What's the reason for this? You know, can we look at this in more detail and run through each one? So make sure those person really has a full opportunity to give you their version of events. Um, the role of the accompanying person is in there. Um, they can um, put forward the case of the employee. They can sum up on behalf of the employee, um, um, but they can't answer any questions that you direct at the employee. So it's, I always set that out at the beginning as well if they have somebody um, accompanying them of what their role is. Now, again, it'll depend who that person is, what experience they've got, and what they want to do. I find an awful lot of the time, if it's an employee, the role of the company person, they tend to, you know, um, just are there to observe proceedings and are quite happy to do so, or sum up, or make some very logical notes in it, or say, well, actually, it wasn't truly like that because I was there, there um, uh, you know, I do this job regularly too, and give a point of view like that, which can be really useful. Um, union representatives might may be more active and I've had some that have been very active. I've had some um, very negative union represent, uh, representatives. I've had some fantastic union representatives. Um, I've had some that are just downright rude and, um, and abusive. But um, it depends. We're all individuals and it depends what they're there for. I think the more current view of union rep representatives that they do want to work together and they can give a very logical sense to it too. But I would make sure that you have that role out there. Um, have I experienced individuals with language barriers who need appropriate representation? Um, I um, I have where English is perhaps a second language, and we've um, have had um, I did one disciplinary, and we actually invited um, another his supervisor actually who spoke that the guy was um, Polish and didn't speak fantastically well English. So we brought um, the other, the supervisor in who spoke very good English and Polish and kept, you know, going through, going over the points, making sure it was absolutely clear. And it's fine to have somebody on that basis to interpret if you need to. Um, that's the only case I've come across with those language barriers um, would be on, you know, a, um, a diff where English is a second language. But as I say, we want to remove barriers. We want to put this person at ease and be fair. So whatever you need to do, then that's a really important element to it. Um, I've put taking notes, which I've already talked a bit about there. Some of you are saying you record meetings, some of you don't. Always check with the person, make it clear that you're doing that. Now, interestingly, I've had some employees who've come in and um, asked to record the meeting. Again, that there isn't a legal requirement for them to do it. So you can say no if you don't want it recorded, and I have actually done that before. I've told them that it's actually not necessary because we're, doing, um, we're recording it and they will be sent um, a full um, full minutes of the meeting. It's up to you, and I don't know at the end of the day what we're scared of, why we shouldn't do it. It just, you know, in in that particular case, it wasn't appropriate, and I think the manager felt more uncomfortable with that because it was a bit out of their comfort zone. Um, but um, it it 
it depends on what you want to achieve out of it. But I've got no problem with them taking notes. But remember that whatever minutes you take, you could send them a, um, a copy of those too. Um, the interpreter would be, um, I would just put them, a, a, they could, there would be an extra. Um, the way I find it's worked in practice, the interpreter tends to be um, the person that they'd like there as well, as their company person, but that wouldn't always be the case. Um, but I would have them as um, another, really, so they would still have the opportunity to be accompanied by somebody else, because um, they might not be an interpreter in-house. They might have to bring somebody from outside who wasn't a trade union official, so that actually wouldn't fit into the criteria of being the company in person. Um, but again, out of fairness, I would just have that other person there if need be and you did have that okay so when we go in through each point at the end of every one i would make sure that we check that everybody said everything they need to um challenge things if you need to okay so ask some further questions so for example in the the meeting this morning i asked um one lady so did you sign everything that you had done she said yes, and I said, but the evidence shows you signed one that you hadn't done. All oh, right, yeah, yeah, I didn't do that one. So at the end, when I kind of summed up, I said there was a few points that are just concerning me, I'd like a bit more clarity of. So um, I just want to be clear, is there anything else on there that you've initially told me that you have signed for and done that you actually signed for and haven't done? So feel free to challenge some points and to check with people to make sure you're getting the full facts. I want you to leave that disciplinary hearing with a really good understanding of everything that happened um, so you can make a fair ju judgment from there. Okay. So at the end, when everybody said everything they need to, I would advise the employee, um, and, and at the time, like today, one of my um, closing points before the agenda was thank you for your honesty. You know, I really do appreciate that you've come in and talked freely to us. Um, and summarise the facts and so say, this is what we're looking at. You admit this, this and this. You've got a query over that and you've told me these are the reasons for the other. So summarise the facts and make sure they agree with that outcome. Cause say everybody wants to leave the room on the same page. And then adjourn the hearing. Now, we need to adjourn the hearing because that comes into this issue of fairness. Um, and the, you know, we have to make a fair decision. And one key thing is, is employment law and case law is to make something fair, we mustn't have gone in with a judgment or what we, we believe to be. Now, there will be times where you have a good idea or you think, well, on the base of it, if this is correct, then we may be looking at dismissal because in your disciplinary hearing letter, you have wrote at the bottom, the outcome of this may result in dismissal or if this, this is an allegation, um, if proved to be correct, this could be considered as gross misconduct. So you might have had some understanding about um, what level you may be looking at. But we've got to have that adjournment, sit back, look at everything and make the decision. Um, now, fairness is such a hard thing to There's no right or wrong. Um, we have guidance. We have guidance from case law. We have guidance from experience. We have guidance from um, our benchmarks within our organisation and personal viewpoints. But would your judgment of fair be the same as a tribunal judge? Now, I can't answer that, and that's why we have these tribunals, because it's not black and white. Um, there is that element of fairness. But what we're looking at is to back that up. Um, the outcomes we've got from a disciplinary procedure are um, verbal warning, first written, final written, and um, dismissal. Dismissal with notice or gross misconduct, a summary dismissal. Um, and we've got to understand whether we need to put that, or do you have in your policy any other penalties? like a demotion um, from a role, et cetera, which I have done before when I disciplined a supervisor who just wasn't um, uh, completing any supervisory jobs, new into the role, really struggling, and the outcome of that was a demotion, and that was specified in their policy that could be an outcome. Or you're not going to take any action at all. I have done some disciplinaries where we haven't. And um, it can, then, you know, you can turn a, ba a po negative into a real big positive to there to say, right, I've listened to everything you say. I quite understand that. I actually, you know, I don't think this is disciplinary action um, at the moment or from what you've told me. Um, and we're not going to put anything in place. And you can gain a lot of respect from people. You don't have to follow something through to a disciplinary outcome if you don't think it should be there. So the fairness is a hard thing. You know, take some time. But again, I wouldn't say too much time. It'll depend whether you keep somebody's um, 
suspended during this time, remember, on paying benefits. Um, make sure, you know, it's not nice for the person with it hanging over them. And it's not good for your team and your management team. I say it can be quite stressful. So think about a reasonable, is there any other evidence you need to get during that time? Have they thrown up something else that you need to discuss and put more evidence back to them? So it could be actually a journey. You go back for more here and adjourn again before a decision. But in that time, you know, you need to think of, of adequate. Now, the two disciplinaries I've done this morning, I haven't gone back yet, but I will do later in the day. And that's just because I need to um, look at a couple of issues that have been raised during it before I can make a decision. Um yeah, I, I agree with that, where I actually think we need to turn that round because it's a good management practice, to be fair, and, and it's one of the leadership qualities to have that fairness. So I think it's an education of managers in there to say, well, you know, there doesn't necessarily have to be a warning. And sometimes even going through that process, especially if the dreaded HR is involved, you know, people will be really on the, on the toes from it. Um, so I just... You need to look at the situation and don't be afraid to not put action if it doesn't warrant it once you've done the disciplinary action. And it can just send waves. I said this about confidentiality about slaughtering lambs. Um, it can send waves to say, right, you know, actually this organisation is a pretty good one because if something goes wrong or we've got an issue, they'll give us an opportunity to talk about it. But, you know, they're not going to penalise if it's not fair. So it can be a really positive mark. Um yeah, yeah. And it could be that you then, you know, you, you just put something in place of a performance management from it and don't acknowledge it with a disciplinary. Um, what I always say at the end, though, when we go back to that, so I would adjourn and then come back and sit down with the person again to write, reviewed all of the evidence. Now, this is uh, there's a number of ways you can do this. I have before drafted a decision statement and read it out and given them a copy of it, or I've just done that um, from my notes and then confirmed it in writing in the end. Um, so I, um, what I always do say, whatever disciplinary action it is, I always end this of moving forward. So if we put a warning in place, I would say, right, We've acknowledged all of this because of these reasons. We're putting in um, whatever warning that may be to acknowledge it. Now, moving forward, I want to say this, 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 and this, or no more of that, that, and that, or we're going to help you to achieve this by giving you training, doing whatever. Please talk to us. Let's have some reviews. You need a plan going forward because that's how we're going to restore performance to acceptable levels. Or if it was a violent episode, you know, I would, you may have dismissed there, but if there was anything of a lesser degree that didn't happen, then it would be we cannot tolerate this at, at all going forward and that much must stop. Um, so you need to end it. And I, a really common phrase of mine that I hear myself saying all the time is, right, we're drawing a line in the sand. That is behind us now. We're all moving forward. Um, it can't be like, you know, the naughty child where you come in in the huff with them um, for a few weeks in there. You draw the line in the sand. You've acknowledged that behavior. You've set a plan for going forward. And then how you manage that, how you would with any other performance with reviews and support, et cetera, in there. Um, the obviously a critical thing in terms of statutory procedures is the right to appeal. Um, uh, won't we go on in time? So I'm not going to go into appeals massively, but independent person, and that's quite different because that's up to the employee to talk to you at the appeal meeting to tell you why they think that was unfair. So that was a bit of a whistle stop of a disciplinary. I hope I've given you some quite good practical tips. If anybody has any questions or answers, I know we've had some as we go through, but if anybody has anything else, then please do um, note them on the, um, the chat box and I'll aim to answer some of those. Um, thank you, Vicky. Um, that's really nice feedback. I appreciate that. Um, that's great. So, yeah, it's something that I think, um, you know, you're going to get um, a copy of these slides and of um, the recording. And by all means, share that with your manager actually doing disciplinaries and give them some insight into the purpose of it as well. That would be a really good thing um, in uh, if, uh, if things to do. So that's about there for me. Oh, hang on. How do I manage them? an aggressive employee during meeting. Interesting one. Um, I wouldn't tolerate it at all. And I think if you if you try and remove the barriers to take that away, um, 
to to let them know what your purpose of it is and you would you go in with that attitude of look we're looking to deal with this issue and look at an outcome and make it very clear that if they if they start being aggressive verbally or, or whatever that the meeting will be adjourned and there will be disciplinary about about aggressive behavior um or you'll hold the rest of the hearing in their absence as well you've got that as an opportunity so if somebody is getting aggressive in it i'd give them a warning so that that's not going to be tolerated i'm only going to warn you once and if it carries on we'll be adjourned this meeting with you and we'll carry on without you um that's more than acceptable to do that because you shouldn't put yourself at risk in there at all from aggression um so yeah you've got to you've got to follow that through the outcome of it um you know it's not going to be great so i'd be trying to to take that away um however i could but that's not something that i would um, be looking to tolerate whatsoever in there okay um i kind of use a previous one which was issued over 12 months ago no not if there's a lapse of 12 months um i use six for verbal warnings and 12 for um written warnings if they've expired they can't be brought up to say you've got a warning we're building upon it what you can do is to say this has been an ongoing employment if it's for the same issue an ongoing employment a problem within your employment that we've addressed on numerous occasions before your warnings aren't currently active but it is noted that this has been an ongoing problem um, but you couldn't build on it, for example, if they were given a first written warning 18 months ago, you couldn't then move to a final because it's expired, but you could bring it into the equation to say this has been an ongoing problem. Yep. Okay. So I'll get on to wrapping this up. If anybody has any more questions, do continue to type and I can um, come back to you individually on those. Um, but that was me. Um, as I say, my um, company, The Business Springboard, please do check us out and uh, uh, link up with me on LinkedIn. Um, it'd be lovely to hear from you and get any more feedback. And as I said, all the training that we do is practitioners as well as um, trainers. It's very live. Like, as I said, you can draw on real life for experience um, and management, leadership and soft skills, people management are my key areas too. Um, let me just look at that one more question before we go from Karen. Uh, I guess you can continue that on this. Mm, interesting, because they would be a protection under the DDA. Um, there's two things. Your comparison under the DDA would be somebody without the disability, and then you've got to ask what would you tolerate um, and what's safe for the employees. And if they became aggressive would you tolerate aggression for somebody who didn't have Asperger's or autism? And that, you know, you've got to think about you creating a safe environment not only for them but the other staff within it. Again, I would look at um, if if they became obviously agitated, there are some where I've adjourned them early. I've made it clear if anybody wants a break, take five minutes, then we're happy to do so. I would look in that case, you don't want to get into that big conflict. I would make sure that adequate support from the company person I would have regular breaks, but I also would set the um, the tone from it about, you know, that you when somebody's getting agitated, I would stop it then in that situation. So we're going to have a break. We can't continue with this aggression. We'll have a break and we'll come back from that. If it ultimately did get to the point where the aggression was taken over, then, you know, I... At my personal view on that um, would be that you, you couldn't tolerate that within a disciplinary hearing or at all in the workplace as well. But I would do everything I can to alleviate and make whatever adjustments I could so the breaks, so the adequate um, a company person, etc., etc. I hope that, that helps on that question. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. I do always enjoy presenting webinars and could talk all day. <laughs> um, so I'll now pass you back to Richard, but thank you so much.